Hi, I'm Edward Thompson and welcome to this episode of Pictures on My Mind. Um, this is the second part of a multiple part uh, video series about the history of protest photography. In the first chapter I covered from 1848 to the mid-70s and in this episode I'll be covering from the mid-70s to 2009. Um, there's a slight continuity error in this video which some of you might pick up on, being very visually astute people. I won't give it away but let's just say I filmed half of this video a few weeks ago and then something changed. So yeah, keep an eye out for that one. On April 30th, 1978, thousands gathered in Trafalgar Square to respond to a rise in racism fomented by organisations like the National Front. The crowd marched to Victoria Park in East London for a concert called Rock Against Racism, where bands like The Clash, X-Ray Specs and other artists performed to around 100,000 people. And there were some amazing photographers covering uh, that time. So between the photographer Red Sorders and the photographer Sid Shelton, there's a huge amount of work you can check out, okay? If you're interested in the music from that era, uh, or you're just interested in history, I, I do urge you to check out their work because it's an amazing document of that time. The Green and Common protests were against the storage of nuclear weapons at Berkshire Airfield by the United States Army. There was a peace camp there from 1981 to 2000 of only women. The photographer Rasa Page captured events at the camps between 1982 and 1986, revealing the strength and togetherness of the women involved. Now, I might be way off on this, but this photograph kind of seemed familiar to me. The idea of a ring of um, a ring of protesters connected with nuclear, and it got me thinking. I know this is a complete tangent, okay? It's just how my mind works, but it got me thinking of a Simpsons episode. So a March day and night by, by the big cooling tower. They have the plans, but we have the power. Between March 1984 and March 1985, more than half of the country's 187 miners left work in what was the biggest industrial dispute in post-war Britain. The nationwide strike was a last attempt by the mining unions to save the industry after the National Coal Board announced 20 pits in England would have to close with the loss of 20,000 jobs. Those who went on strike earned no money or were ineligible for benefits as their industrial action was deemed illegal. They had to rely on scrimping, savings and handouts. There was no safety net. These are the photographs of Keith Patterson, and wow, they show the most incredible and heartfelt scenes of community pulling together against the government and the police. You know, and in lots of these images, you can really see just where the photographer chose to stand has a huge kind of like, you know, you can kind of see what, what side of the fence he's on. Do you know what I mean? In a lot of the photos, you'll see like, a, there'll be like a mother and a child. In the background, there'll be some riot police, or there'll be like police in the street, and out of the window will be a small child kind of looking on. You got me? You can see that kind of tension in, in his photographs. And yeah, it's amazingly well documented. Now, this work got me thinking, because in the UK now, for the last few years, under this Tory government, we've had strike after strike after strike, and it's just covered so many facets of our everyday life. So where's the photo essay? Where are the stories? You know, it just it just seems weird to me, right? I can't think of any kind of significant body of work by, say, one photographer documenting all these strikes. Now, maybe I overlooked it, maybe I missed it, but it doesn't seem to be there. And I think obviously it's down to the state of like photojournalism and journalism right now. Um, it's something I would have loved to have done. Um, a lot of the work I did when I was younger, like pretty much all the protest photography I'm going to show you in a later video, I didn't really get paid for any of that. Okay. And that's something you can absorb when you're a teenager in your early 20s, but when you're married, when you've got kids, when you've got a mortgage, you can't just up sticks and just spend days and days and days photographing, let's face it though, some significant historical event, but you just can't, you just don't have the luxury to do it. So yeah, it, it'd be great if there was some system in place to support um, the documentation of these historical events in the UK, but there doesn't seem to be. The Battle of Beanfield was a culmination of the free festival movement. Groups who travelled with their families in truck convoys seeking a free way of life, rather than living in the hellish squalor that most of Britain's major cities had become under Tory Britain. A clinch point was in 1985 when the convoy tried to get to Glastonbury Music Festival. Anything, mate, they smashed me windows. They hit me on the head with truncheons. They hit me when I was on the floor. On the deck, on the deck. No. On the deck. Are you still there, boy? They then started using their truncheons to smash windows. 
hundreds of police officers, batons waving, smashing the window as this thing was still moving. They brought it to a halt by standing in front. There were a lot of people in it. It was, it was their home. And they absolutely trashed it. They just went in. They smashed the window, smashed the door down, got inside, and you could, all you could hear was screaming. What we, the ITN camera crew, and myself as a reporter have seen in the last 30 minutes here on this field has been some of the most brutal police treatment of people I've witnessed in my entire career as a journalist. We're genuine people just like yourselves, and we need help right now. Please, help us, all of you. Help us, stand by us. I see that guy saying, like, pleading, help us, stand by us. And it's really hard, you know? It's really hard. I mean, if I'd been, not been four years old, I'd been straight down there. Um, but yeah. And I think watching that kind of archive news footage, you're just sort of seeing all these traveller people who are just like, they just seem really nice and sweet and gentle. And yet, you know, I remember in the tail end of the 80s and 90s, very clearly from the media in the UK, that travellers were dangerous, travellers were nightmare, travellers, you know, they were just totally demonised by, by the press and by society. Why can't you just leave the field? They won't let us go. If we leave, we'd be arrested, or worse. Like, there's people, you see them bleeding. But like, I ain't gonna find Mrs. being bashed. Not now. I mean, it's now. You know, love and peace and all that's one thing, but when it's, it's real people with real things on them, right, it just don't wash no more. And this lot, all these coppers are just here for one reason, and that's to cause trouble. I mean, I don't want to cause trouble. I ain't gonna cause trouble. I ain't got a stick or anything. I just want to go, just go quiet, so the baby can be born, I have a decent start in life, not surrounded by a thousand coppers, with sticks and shields. I mean, that guy with his girlfriend, and he's like being like, well, I'm not a threat to anyone, I don't even have a, have a stick. He doesn't even have a stick. He's, he's, he's the monster, he's the massive threat to your government, it just, seem, it just seems absolutely absurd. And again, that one final thing that's just burned into my brain, that poor screaming woman covered in blood being dragged out of that bus by riot police. Like, it's just, it's unthinkable. And the weird thing is, is that it's not that long ago, really. And yeah, it just makes you kind of wonder, you know, if no one had been there that day filming, like, what would we know of that event? It's just, it's so important for me. You know, the documentation of protest is so important. The Tiananmen Square protests were student-led demonstrations held in Tiananmen Square in Beijing during 1989. The protests started on April 15th and were forcibly suppressed on June the 4th when the government declared martial law and sent the military to occupy central parts of Beijing. In what became known as the Tiananmen Square Massacre, troops with assault rifles and tanks fired at the demonstrators and those trying to block the military's advance into Tiananmen Square. Estimates of the death toll vary from several hundred to several thousands, with thousands more wounded and probably created one of the most iconic protest photographies we've seen in the 20th century, which came to be known as Tank Man. And if I'm getting this right, again, from memory, from conversations many years ago, there was a load of press photographers who couldn't get access. They were forced to stay in their hotel room, but there was a balcony. And they saw these tanks coming down and one lone protester with a bag, he just walked out in front of the tanks and the tanks stopped. And obviously you can only imagine what happened next. But um, the photographers on that balcony got a bunch of photos. And I think it was interesting because a lot of photographers essentially got the same photo because they were all photographing from that, that point they had to stand in. But it did create one of the most iconic shots just purely because of the angle and the scale. You know, you think about most protest photography and a lot of the really good stuff is very near, very close. Really, this is just a wide shot and it's such an allegory. Tank, man. It's, it's the... It, the, the <laughs> It's just unfairness, isn't it, really? It's just ridiculous. It's like the you know, expression, you're bringing a, a, a knife to a gunfight, you're bringing a freaking carrier bag to a tank fight. It is absolutely obscene and absurd. It's just, it's almost a surrealist image, but we know how horrific that, that image really was because obviously what, what transpired. The community charge, or poll tax, was implemented in 1989 under Margaret Thatcher's conservative government and proved to be massively decisive and a huge problem for the Conservative government um, because there was just outspread protests and rioting. And the reason was, is they changed the taxation system. Say, if you were living in a house of six people, your family of six in one, say, terrace, 
and there was like a millionaire living in a, a bloody mansion on his own, the taxation rate was dependent on how many people lived in the house, not the price of the property. Okay, so yeah, terrible. Um, riots occurred across all of the UK and one of the biggest protests was obviously in London. The largest, one of the largest protests was in Trafalgar Square in 1990 and just an institution of British protest photography is a photographer David Hoffman and he was there that day and took some amazing photographs. And I will talk about him later. 200,000 protesters marched to Trafalgar Square. It became another nail in the coffin of Margaret Thatcher's reign as she resigned later that year and the poll tax was scrapped in 1991. More than 50,000 ravers, squatters and travellers marched from Hyde Park to Trafalgar Square in July 1994 uh, to protest the Criminal Justice Act. The law included a clause that attacked rave culture, aiming to ban music characterised by the omission of a succession of repetitive beats. Yeah, uh, the British government passed a law where if you congregated over a certain number, I can't remember, was it 11, was it 5, something like that, and you listened to music that had a certain BPM, that was breaking the law. Obviously didn't affect any classical music concerts because there's no drum, there's no bass. Now, 2001, the May Day protest. Now historically May Day is always a massive day for socialist protests and it was a massive one. May Day 2001 in central London. And I was there. I was a first year student, I had my friend Stuart and um, we went into uni and we we're going to have to sit for another lecture and lecture about Cindy Sherman and we looked at each other and we'd seen some of the newspapers that morning and the newspaper said um, samurai sword wielding anarchists will be protesting today at the May Day protest so we thought well Cindy Sherman samurai sword wielding psychopaths oh yeah so we hopped in his fiesta and off we went now I shot a fair bit of 35mm, it was chucking it down with rain, it was a really crazy environment and what made it even more crazy was the first instance of kettling in the UK in protest history. Now kettling was a system where they'd get loads of protesters, they'd quickly gather the police into lines and block them in, kettle them and keep them there and they kept them in Oxford Circus that day May Day 2001 for seven hours. A number of rallies were organised ahead of the G20 summit in London in 2009. On April the 1st, two to 3,000 people joined the climate camp in the city outside the European Climate Exchange. And basically right next to that was the Bank of England. And a load of protesters marched as part of the G20 meltdown protest from London Bridge all the way to the Bank of England. And again, I was there at this one. I was photographing. And uh, I didn't have a press card at that point. I was sort of trying to weave in and out and at some point I, I left the press, I left the cordon of the protesters and they, the police wouldn't let me back in so I just stood at the edge and the tragic thing is, is the spot where I stood for like another three hours and then went back, that was the exact spot where a riot police officer shoved a bypasser who was a newspaper seller called Ian Tomlinson, shoved him, he fell to the ground and he later died. Okay, so again, just, you know, it's, they're, they're potentially really dangerous places, okay, protests can be really dangerous. And often it's not the protesters you've got to worry about, but it's this, well, it's such, such drama and such tension. Another thing that happened at that protest, because um, obviously the police were being so heavy handed, was uh, David Hoffman, I mentioned earlier, uh, a riot policeman from the Met saw him and jammed his shield in his teeth, knocking out five of his teeth. He had a press card clearly out there, whatever. Anyway, um, managed to get some lawyers involved. He managed to get um, some payoff and his teeth fixed, whatever. But yeah, again, dangerous place. And he was 64. At that point in 2009, David Hoffman was 64 and they attacked him like that, okay? So then David obviously is going to keep photographing protests because he's done it for decades. The next big protest was the student protest about student fees when the Liberal Democrats teamed up with the Conservative government and introduced these massive fees for students. So obviously David Hoffman was there. And what was really bizarre, at least how he said it, was that the police were kind of not going near him. In fact, they were helping him up when he fell over or like avoiding bumping into him because obviously after what they'd done to him and got caught, um, doing it, he was like a golden boy. So again, he got incredible photographs at the student protest that year purely because he was able to get so near and not be messed with. So amazing. So yeah, if you like protest photography, if you're interested in the history of, say, London, you've got to check out David Hoffman. He's got an amazing archive on his website. So yeah, go check him out. 
So that's the end of chapter two. In chapter three, I'll be cutting into anything from like 2011 onwards. That will include the Arab Spring, the Occupy Movement and other sort of Extinction Rebellion. So other stuff happening there. So yeah, please do check that one out too.